I'm Todd Harris, and welcome to this episode of Tending Bar. While we've been making this, this series of recordings, and especially right now as we make this one, uh, you can see we're working from home during the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. And uh, a lot of the legal issues that are cropping up are issues related to that pandemic, things that are uh, peculiar to this time. And today we have a very special guest with us, a, a friend and colleague of mine, Ted Claypool, who is really one of the nation's leading privacy attorneys. Ted has written uh, extensively at this point about uh, privacy-related issues, but here recently about privacy-related issues stemming from the COVID-19 pandemic. In particular, issues that arise related to data collection uh, that, that is done for good purposes related to public health, but that raises questions. And we're going to talk about that uh, somewhat today. So uh, oftentimes uh, we're, we're spending time during, in, in tending bar uh, talking about ethical issues, about bigger questions in the law. I can think of almost no better place where a regular legal practice and those bigger ethical questions meet than in a practice related to privacy law. And so Ted's practice is often a practice advising on ethical questions. And we're going to hear a bit about that today. So if you will, let's welcome Ted Claypool to join us here on Tending Bar. Ted, hey, welcome. You're online. You. Yeah, thanks for being with us today. Terrific. Listen, Ted, uh, forward to it. You, you, there's so much interesting about your, your practice. I'm hopeful that you'll be a guest on Tending Bar multiple times uh, as we continue doing so. this. Uh, today, we're, we're going to talk about something specific, but before we get into that specific, I want to ask you a couple of questions. First, for starters, uh, we've been asking all of our guests yeah, this simple question. How is it that you came to be a lawyer in the first place? What drew you to the study of law and the practice of law? Yeah, it's a good question. It's mostly with me, um, the flexibility of it. I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do. I was a public policy major in college. So there was a chance I wanted to work in government. I had done internships through college in a you know, Fortune 50 business. So I liked that, and I thought I might want to do that. Um, and my father was a lawyer, and I knew private practice uh, could be rewarding. And so I went into it because with a law degree, you can basically do nearly anything you want. Um, and so uh, it, it allowed me to, um, from an immaturity standpoint, push off decisions until much later. Um, but, but from a practical standpoint, to um, give me the kind of training that allowed me to choose what I wanted to do later on. You know, it sounds like the answer I hear from a lot of lawyers. You say, I got out of, of college, a four-year undergrad degree, and I wasn't sure what I really wanted to do. So I thought, I'll go to law school and it will give me options. So, exactly. uh, so, so you went to law school and began practice, but you landed in a very specialized kind of career uh, focusing on privacy law, information security, information privacy. How did, you, how did you come to that practice? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, actually, about four years into my practice, my senior partner, I was at a small law firm in Ohio, and my senior partner sat down with me and said, you know, you're never going to get what you want out of your career doing what I did with my career, <laughs> which is being a business generalist. And so everything is specializing. You need to look at how you might want to specialize. And I did. I took six months and some classes and figured that I wanted to be a software lawyer at that point. There wasn't much point in saying you're a data lawyer because nobody would have known what that meant. Um, but so I started to work in, in with software companies and, and build out from there. And pretty soon the internet came by and, uh, and I, I got lots of work out of, uh, out of everything that was changing on the internet, but not enough for the small firm I was in. It was difficult to get the amount of specialty business that I wanted. And so 
I, I went in-house for a little while, first with a company called CompuServe, which Todd is old enough to remember, but most everybody who listens to this won't be. <laughs> oh, that's true. Um, <laughs> sort I had of a the CompuServe account. Before there was an internet. Yeah. What's that? I had a CompuServe account, like yep. most people yep. with well, as much gray hair you, as we did. That's right. You were you were one of the you were one of the the smart and ambitious ones, um, but uh, but then I went from there to be the technology lawyer for Bank of America, um, and learned. I thought it would be interesting to to see what it would be like to be in a data company that didn't realize it was a data company. You know, the nice thing about their data is it actually means money, <laughs> and so it has numismatic value. Um, so, but, like, uh, like a number of our guests, I think you're being a little modest, Ted, um, because you were, you were sort of the top data lawyer at CompuServe, right? And then, and then likewise, oh, sort yeah. of the top privacy lawyer for Bank of America. Yeah, um, no, I mean, they, they basically said what one of my bosses said, I just, I think you're an Idaho lawyer. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, well, anything that comes up in Idaho, we give it to you. It doesn't matter what it is. <laughs> and it, basically what he meant was the internet and... IT and privacy and data and software and computers, whatever came up at Bank Anything of America. Anything far out there. Fell onto my desk. Yeah. All right. Okay. Idaho, I sure is appreciative with the association with, with the internet and all things technical. So, Yeah. Uh, and then for the last 20 years, I've been with Womble um, uh, selling my services to the general public and to people like Bank of America, for example. And for that reason, we partner uh, quite quite often as I represent software companies too. And I deal on the transactional side and you often on compliance side or counseling around uh, how to use their, their data. So tell, tell us a bit about I your just pitched your services practice. today, by the way. Thank you. Very appreciative. So we'll discuss that later. <laughs> tell us about your day-to-day. What, what kinds of advice does a privacy lawyer give? What, what, what is a privacy lawyer? Well, right now... Um, and this isn't totally normal, but right now I'm in the middle of a data breach issue for a couple of our different clients. One of them is big, one that probably everybody here will read about. I can't talk about specifics right now, but, um, you know, basically I am their breach counsel. So, you know, we need to decide um, what kind of deci- what kind of uh, communications we can make, how we can deal with the with the um, person that kidnapped the information, if we can, and and what we do in that negotiation, and you know what we have to do with our customers, our clients, their clients who are affected by it. So that's just one aspect of it. Otherwise, um, I do a lot of consulting. People will call me about data issues and privacy issues and data security issues and say, how should we do this? Are we, if we do it this way, are we meeting the new laws in California? Um, are we able to do this in Europe or Canada where the laws are very different? So we work with clients on that kind of thing. And then finally, there's a lot of contracts involved. So, you know, as people hire a data security firm to come in and help them or a forensics company to go um, do white hat hacking or to do research for on what's going on in their system. They need somebody that understands the technology part of it and the data part of it in order to make sure that their contract is appropriate. Right, well, so it's uh, it's good to bring it around to contracts. When we think about business law uh, and lawyers acting on behalf of businesses, uh, corporations can do almost anything that can be contracted so long as they're not otherwise breaking laws, but, they can they can agree to provide um, all kinds of services to one another and all kinds of rights, uh, you know, to one another. But privacy right. law is not, different. One thing on that, before we go too far into it, that's one of the big issues for the big breach issue we have going on right now. Is the kind of data that is involved is unlikely to be the kind of data that the states under state laws are regulating. However, that doesn't mean it's not private data that people care about deeply. And so the issue with this is not what does the law say, which is easy for a lawyer. It is what does the contract say? Um, Because we've made, you know, the the client that we're dealing with has made commitments to its own customers 
um, of how they're going to treat things when, when something like this happens. And so it's entirely driven by contract. It's not really even driven by the privacy laws. Well, so, um, so to, on that point, there, there are some aspects of privacy practice that are unlike uh, a standard corporate practice, and that is that, first of all, the laws from jurisdiction to jurisdiction can, can vary quite a lot. And so um, companies who, let's say, possess consumer information about consumers from a lot of different places find themselves needing to comply with the laws of a lot of different places, which most often means they have to comply with the strictest law because they don't maintain different databases and so on. In the United States, that happens to be California currently, but um, or comply with the laws of the European Union if... if uh, if uh, we're in possession of data that's that's covered by by their laws, so um, that that's an, a complication. But interestingly, um, we don't let companies get away with just anything just because they could contract for it when it comes to consumers' data. Uh, so many of the laws today are evolving to be protective of consumers and what businesses are allowed to get away with. Can you talk to that just a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, according to Europeans and some Canadians, uh, the U.S. has a bad reputation in what they say not protecting privacy. And I would say that is absolutely not true. Um, what we don't have here in this country is a big omnibus privacy law that covers every possible thing that you could possibly use. Instead, we from early on, decided that there were a couple areas that were really important to us and should be important to everybody. Um, number one is anything dealing with children. So we've had laws protecting information about children as long as there's been an internet and actually longer. We've also had laws protecting your financial information since before there was an internet. And so we're very, very tight about protecting people's financial information. Um, similarly, we have very tight laws about protecting healthcare information. Um, the places that I think there, there's a little issue with those, in my opinion, of they only relate to doctors and hospitals and specific um, organizations that you're, you're giving your information to for a very specific reason. For example, if you give your uh, if you give a DNA sample to your doctor to check something for you, then that is covered completely uh, by the law, and they're not allowed to um, pass that on to anybody for any reason. However, if you give your DNA to 23andMe, um, or at the moment Weight Watchers is asking for, for your DNA, they can do anything the heck they want with it, and they do. Um, and they they sell it to other people. They create... They, build all a database of all this and they they sell it to drug companies so you know there are things that we protect here but but there's there's also some some ways out the other thing that's interesting that we do in this country and we have done for a long time is we have um, data breach notice laws uh, which are in many cases 15 18 years old um, which said, essentially, we know that if somebody takes your data, they could use it for identity theft. And therefore, we'd like to make sure that if this happens, you learn about it from the person that lost your data. Okay, It's interesting because the European Union, which has a reputation for overprotecting privacy in a lot of ways, just implemented a couple of years ago their first um, data breach notice laws. So, um, you know, I'm dealing with some clients on this today, and the truth is there's no case law in Europe because they don't know what they're doing over there yeah. in this space because they've never done it before, <laughs> but we have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I, want, I want to come back around to that DNA question in just a moment, but it just it, it highlights that the nature of a privacy practice is sometimes all the more challenging because the, the advice to be given is not quite black and white. Um, so, so often, as, as in the general data protection regulation in Europe, the standards are about reasonableness and uh, level of effort kinds of, of rules. And so what's reasonable under the circumstances is, is sometimes 
a judgment call. And so, right. and a very good example of that is almost all of these breach notice laws here and abroad have some sort of a time limit that you're supposed to get the information. And most contracts that deal with you tell us if you have a breach, they have a time limit too. Um, those time limits generally are way too short because um, having a data breach, especially a big sophisticated one, is like being in a battle. Um, there's the fog of war. You don't know exactly what's going on. You don't know what data was taken. You're not even sure whether the bad guy's still in there taking more data. I mean, there's just a lot of mess you've got to resolve before you can start talking about it. Um, and so, you know, most people, when they look at it, would say, well, you have 72 hours to, uh, to report this. Well, I mean, the truth is we may have learned that we had a problem a month ago, <laughs> but we, we don't, don't know what to report yet. Ex- right. We don't know what to report yet. We don't know the extent of what damage there was or, or if your information was compromised one way or the other. And we may not know that for another month. And to me, once we know that, that's when the 72 hours starts. However, there's not any case law out there that says that's the way that people would examine that. And I know lots of people don't think that's the case, mostly because they don't know how to manage data breach. Um, so, yeah, it's very interesting because there's a lot of judgment in this space in, in the law and in contracting right now. Um, and some of it comes down to um, just practicality. What can you do and when do you actually know what the problem is? Right, right. What well, highlights the the need to have a a privacy attorney with good judgment, uh, someone who uh, has has seen all the issues, who is not uh, a part time privacy lawyer, but someone who is really focused and uh, with a lot of experience like yourself. So, um, we we today I was hoping that we would spend a, a few minutes talking about some particular issues that you've been writing about lately. You've you've published several articles during the COVID-19 pandemic, talking about data collected um, related to COVID-19, say contact tracing data, um, and which is done for laudable purposes, for, for public health related purposes, but that might raise some concerns. So for example, when you mentioned the, the DNA collections a moment ago that are regulated if done by a covered entity under HIPAA, but uh, or their business associates, but not regulated in the same way if they were collected by a private company like 23andMe or Weight Watchers. Um, we can imagine all kinds of things that could be done with that, with that DNA. What if, what if we have accumulated an, a nationwide database of every person's DNA, and uh, that data is used predictively to say this person has a predisposition to condition X, and then that information were to be used in a hiring decision or a promotions decision, that kind of thing would make most of us uncomfortable, right? We might think that's not fair. Um, those are, right. you or know, your DNA is an immutable yeah. characteristic, just like your hair color right. or eye color or skin color or gender, right? So um, so those are, those are um, sensitive topics. I wonder if you'll just talk to us a little bit about the kinds of data that you think might be sensitive around this COVID-19 and some of the issues that you're seeing. But maybe we can uh, talk about some of the examples in other countries that we're already seeing that are problematic. Yeah, I mean, let's talk in general first in that um, one of the interesting things about this area is that the very good work that you need to do to try and slow down and stop a pandemic and, and to try and make sure that most that more people live and less people die and that less people get sick, Um, you know, it means tracking people's location if you can. It means finding out who those people are that are sick and seeing who they talk to. And, And because that's the issue of a pandemic. It is when individuals come face to face with other individuals that you can pass something like this. And so, um, it's very important to get as much information as you can about where it could spread. I mean, if you know, for example, that people are come, are very sick right now in Turin, Italy, which was a hot spot a while back, um, 
you know, you, you know that uh, you probably need to be careful with people coming back from there into your cities. I mean, that's one of the issues that they had in Germany was the big COVID problems they had first were all um, people coming back from ski holidays in northern Italy um, and, and bringing it back with them. Um, but if you, you know that kind of thing, it makes it, it's a, from a public health standpoint, it's, it's good to be able to do that. But like a lot of things, um, just because this is a good thing doesn't mean that it's, it's good all the way around and for everybody and every purpose. It is good for its one reason. Um, and in doing this, you get lots of information about people. Um, but that information, once it's gathered, once it's pulled together, can be misused. I mean, the example that I use at the beginning of my, of my last article in this was um, in the early 1900s, uh, the Dutch had a fairly extensive welfare state. And in order to do that, they kept lots of information about people, all for good reasons, to make sure they got enough to eat, to make sure that they had jobs. And, um, for example, they took religious information because if you were the last person in your family to die, they wanted to make sure, the state wanted to make sure they buried you in the way that was respectful of your religious wishes. All good reasons. Of course, when the Nazis came in, here was this database of everybody by religion um, and many, many other um, information points about them that would have, uh, that, that made the Nazis interested in killing them, frankly. Um, and so you can collect lots of data for very good reasons. And in this day and age, with our cell phones, our, our smartphones, and the GPS we have and the, the other um, location tracking we have, it's so easy to do that with people, but that can be a bigger problem. So just Terry on that for a second, I'm not sure that everyone who's watching this would be aware of just what can be tracked about your location. So if you if you have an iPhone, a recent iPhone, uh, not even that recent, or a Samsung Galaxy or other Android smartphone, then um, carriers can keep a record of yeah. everywhere you've been very precisely. There's four, there's four um, actual tools on your phone that let them track where you are specifically. Um, there's a GPS coordinate that tracks you by satellite. And you can turn that off, although what's interesting is a lot of the apps that you have might turn it back on um, because they want to use it. And if they turn it back on, then it can be used by anybody. So you have to be careful about that. But, but beyond that, there's three others. They can track you by regular cell transmissions. In other words, this is how, even if it wasn't a smartphone, just a regular telephone, um, you could be tracked because what they do is triangulate where your signal is coming from and what cell towers it's hitting. And they can tell roughly and pretty precisely where you are. Another way to fairly precisely tell where you are is if you have your, wi your Wi-Fi on because they'll know, oh, he just hit the Wi-Fi that was at close to the Apple store downtown or they just hit the Wi-Fi at the airport in, in the lounge. Um, so that tells them fairly precisely where you are, which is part of the reason that Apple bugs you all the time to try and get you to turn your Wi-Fi on because um, it makes it easier for them to know where you are and to, and to build in for mapping programs, if, among other things. And then, although it's less uh, of, a, of an issue, all this can happen also through your Bluetooth tracking. Um, that's that's uh, you know not as uh, powerful right. as Wi-Fi, but all four of those things let them track you. And then there's a lot of your apps that don't let you turn those off. So it's very, very uh, difficult to just shut it all down. So there are a lot of good reasons to have those functions in our phones, of course. But, but uh, right now, governments and companies are in an attempt to serve the public health, trying to make use of that data to perform contact tracing so that we, uh, if we know someone has been tested positive uh, for COVID-19, uh, we can see what other phones were in proximity to that person over the recent days when they would have been affected or have, have been incubating the virus. And so by doing that, we make the assumption that if the phones were close, the owners of those phones were close. 
and have been in contact. And then we can see where their phone was and with where well, those contacts were. And we can send out a signal. We can send out a signal to them, Todd, saying um, you were actually close to somebody who was transmitting the virus yesterday. Go get yourself checked or keep yourself away from the nursing home or from your older parents or from your children for the rest of the week until you get checked. So I mean, there are things that we can do to help jump right in using contact tracing and, and help slow down the growth of the virus. So that sounds fantastic. It sounds like a very powerful tool for public health purposes. Um, but in your recent article, uh, which was excellent, we'll, we'll share it uh, online, uh, you talked about some places where that kind of data, though collected for good reasons, has been put to or could be put to bad use. Can you tell us, tell us about some of those circumstances? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the most interesting ones and the one that raised my attention to write the story was in South Korea, um, where um, it was noted by, in the paper, one of the papers, looking at statistics, that a group of, um, of uh, COVID um, infections had started or, or at least been around a certain area, a block of Seoul, South Korea, um, in which there were a lot of bars. And they weren't just regular bars. A lot of them were um, gay bars. And so they started to put out um, uh, a, a proposal that it may be that this is being spread by a certain member or a certain area type of people in the population. Now, why that's particularly concerning in Korea is, the, is unlike a lot of other areas of the world, um, the Koreans uh, actively discriminate um, against, uh, uh, you know, people who are LGBT people, um, and they are very, uh, they're they're very adamant about it. They have a very traditional society, and so um, suddenly this whole group of people that um, that that the society is generally set up to discriminate against are being looked at as the scapegoat. Uh, for the COVID crisis, and it it turned out to be something that was a problem for a lot of people. So this is an open society. This is a you know a society we think of as a democracy and one of the most modern societies in our, in the world. But still, um, when you have that information that you know there was a there was a whole group a cluster of uh, of COVID infections that seemed to be around um, and tied to uh, a a minority group, in this case, LGBT, um, you know, that can be a problem. So just just so we underscore and make it clear, there, there's no information to suggest that COVID-19 has any um, correlation to one's LGBTQ status. And so this is an instance of, of misinterpretation of data by persons who were primed to want to see problems in a in a discriminated against category of persons in, the, in their country. And Absolutely. so they, they embraced that misinterpretation and it was has been used for further discrimination. It's not, not unlike in the first few weeks of, of the pandemic in the United States, we saw discrimination against um, persons from China because, uh, because we were talking about the virus coming from China. Um, Absolutely. Unfortunately. Well, and another yeah. one you, we talk about is India. Um, and, you know, it's, it's very interesting because when you are uh, tracking and tracing people, um, you learn a great deal about them. I mean, there was a study not too long ago in, um, that MIT uh, ran along with the European University that showed that um, even if they didn't have somebody's name, if they have a month of your geolocation of where your phone is, they're 95% able to identify you by name. You know, why is that? Well, outside of a crisis like this, where do you go? You go home and you go to the office. You know, so it's fairly easy to identify a lot of times who those people are. And uh, in, in India, um, they have a, a very tight um, uh, tracing tool right now um, that requires a lot of information. Um, and that can be concerning because the current government in India um, is a nationalist government that is a very pro-Hindu government and a very anti-Muslim government. And 
you know, that's a concern because there are literally hundreds of millions of Islamic people living in India. Um, and to identify them um, through this and say, see where they're going and what they're doing um, in, in a state that has specifically taken action um, to discriminate against them is, is highly problematic. Yeah, yeah. M- much like we, we have resisted in this country making databases of, of people in various religious organizations or uh, denominations or what their faiths are because it can be misused. Precisely that kind of data is being collected. In India, um, if I understand correctly, it's not just the government wanting that data, but that they are also outsourcing the collection of that data to private enterprise. Is that accurate? Yeah, tell That's us about accurate. that. And one, of the, one, of, one of the concerns there is simply that it won't be protected that well. So you have a, you have a concern that, that the government is going to use this intentionally for things that we might think of as, as bad actors, you know, as, as acting bad. But then there's the unintentional problem that the more cooks that are in the soup, involved in the soup, um, and particularly when you're dealing with private um, industry um, and, and not careful about it, you know, that information can get out to lots and lots of bad actors that are not official. In the, in the Korea case, how is it that the information came to public light? How, how did those who connected the Lose dots, how, how did they get access? Because it was a journalist. Uh, the newspaper was just looking at, at um, public um, information about clusters of the disease, where it was tracked and where they saw it. And they said, well, among all the cluster issues, there was one cluster here, and I know who's there. You know, because that's the that's yeah. the area where this kind of people hang out. Well, it really highlights and, the need so need for having it re- highlights the need for having um, re- reasonably clear rules that protect protect private industries that protect individuals' rights relative to what private industry can do with the data they collect, as well as well, what government can do with the data. That they right, and the EU right now is is sort of wrestling with this whole problem. They they want to have a um, a COVID uh, tracing kind of program, um, but they also want to do it in a way that protects individual privacy. And part of the problem is that those those two goals um, are very difficult to do together. I mean, yeah. uh, protecting in one way is is very easy, but then it, it harms you in the other way. And so trying to protect it and um, and and find out as much information as you can is is really turning out to be one of the first big tests of the European privacy rules, the GDPR, um, and and how they work um, for governments as they as they try and you know, protect their citizens in in other situations. Yeah, yeah. Well, so governments and companies in Europe and Asia are not the only ones interested in contact tracing. Uh, the United States, obviously, is uh, is very interested in this. And there's been a bit of press about large companies here as well that have been um, developing tool sets to enable that. Uh, can you tell us maybe a bit about about that, maybe about Apple or Google yeah, or some of the others. Yeah, I was going to say Google and Apple uh, were actually working together, and it was it was more of a probably more of a of a news story because Google and Apple were working together sure. than what they were building. Um, but but what they uh, were working on was a contact tracing application. Um, right now, it hasn't frankly gone very far. There are others that the government itself was creating that are more likely to be usable in this country. Um, but, um, you know, I think what's interesting is you have a, uh, an emergency like this pandemic. And um, one of the concerns is that, that Google and Apple or the government or somebody else will develop um, uh, con- contact tracing application and we'll all have it on our phones from here on out. And that information will end up being used for other things. Um, things right. that we can't even think of right now and things that we might think of as problematic when they start to be used a year from now or five years from now. You know, it's similar to the DNA issue that if somebody takes your DNA and then they end up like a couple of the, um, 
of the the ancestry type companies selling it to the police. Um, right. You know, that could easily be used not just to highlight whether you committed a crime, but also your first or second cousin right. or your children. Um, so it's, you know, it, it is, it's not the, it's not the good purpose that you take it for in the first place. That's the problem. It's the fact that now you have this database and you can do all sorts of things with it. And some of those things may not be uh, savory. Well, and in the case of the contact tracing data, uh, the, the fear is guilt by association uh, of otherwise innocent persons. So um, as we're recording this, we're just at the end or the start of a second week following upon six nights of unrest across the country following the death of George Floyd in, in Minneapolis. And so there have been protesters in a lot of, a lot of those places. And some of those protests have become unruly and even violent. And uh, persons have been hurt, but property has been damaged. If, if that kind of data is freely collectible by the government, um, you know, there's the concern that where, where one person may have culpability, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the person who was in proximity did. But that kind of data can make that implication or suggest that that guilt. That would be a, right. a perfect well, but example. Take, take this the next step further. I mean... There are also protests going on in um, China, in, in Hong Kong in particular. Yeah. And the government is cracking down hard. And as far as they're concerned, anybody that's, you know, within two streets of the protest is guilty um, and, and could be jailed. Yeah. Now, we don't do that in this country, but, you know, it would be an easy thing to track who was at the protest um, if you have the right statistics and the right availability of of GPS or other positioning and contact tracing. Right. Well, uh, Ted, we appreciate your expertise. And I appreciate you being with us here today. These are some terribly important issues for us all to be thinking about. I wonder if you maybe just have some some summary or some closing words to have us thinking about as we uh, as we address these issues related to COVID nineteen in the coming weeks. Sure. I mean, and it's an interesting area of law. And one of the things you find out when you um, when you pick a, um, a a way to practice um, when you're a lawyer is you can often make it uh, relevant um, to the things that are important to you. And you know, the area of law that I practice in obviously has some concerns about protecting people's privacy in the in the COVID nineteen practice, um, but there are you know, companies that are that are out there trying to, uh, um, you know, make the things that are important to us, whether it's medications or protective gear or other things, um, you know, and lawyers are helping with that. Um, so there, there's a number of different ways that you as a lawyer can uh, make sure that um, that the people that are active right now and um, and exercising their right to protest peacefully um, are protected um, and don't get themselves in trouble in ways that they shouldn't. Um, and all of this is, uh, is right in the middle of what you can do as a lawyer. And it's one of the things I like about practicing law is that I can apply it um, to the things that are important to me. Yeah. And not, not just important to you, Ted, you're a great example of um, a highly skilled, focused attorney whose practice um, helps us deal with new issues that are arising as technology advances where the law has not yet caught up and, uh, and is struggling to keep up. And you're helping, helping us to navigate that. So uh, that's terrific. I, d I don't want to leave without, uh, uh, I don't want to fail to uh, invite you to tell us a little bit about your new book. So you've published a number of books and you've got got something new coming out that related to artificial yeah. intelligence. Can you, yeah, can you tell us just a, a little about um, that? I'm, absolutely. I'm uh, editor of this book. I've written some of it, but um, collected um, all of the 750 pages, all the writing uh, of, of this from myself and others. Well, let's put it this way. I conned 30 other, <laughs> 30 high-level lawyers into writing chapters uh, for us. Uh, but there's, there's, it's called the Law of Artificial Intelligence and Smart Machines. Um, and 
Uh, it's put out by the American Bar Association, and there are some phenomenal lawyers and judges and professors and deans um, who have written in this, um, including one of the top um, military uh, judges in the country who's written on AI and the law of war, in particular the law of autonomous killing machines. Um, there are really, really sharp people that have written about um, autonomous driving and, and what we need to be worried about there and how, um, whether or not AI will ever have legal rights in this country. Um, and so I would strongly suggest that if it's something you're interested in, um, we, you can get you, get a copy and uh, see what you think. Great. It's fascinating. Fascinating. I look forward to reading it. Well, uh, thank, thanks, Ted. Appreciate you being here. And uh, thank, thanks to all of you for, uh, for joining us on this episode of Tending Bar. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, the area of privacy law is um, absolutely crucial to America going forward. As, as technology continues to advance, we confront issues for which existing law is not prepared. Uh, so we're, we're sometimes struggling to graft older legal frameworks onto current issues, and that's often inadequate um, or just very, very difficult to do. We need great, thoughtful lawyers like Ted to help us navigate those waters. And um, as his many publications and speeches have done, he continues to help us uh, think through those issues. I encourage you to take a look at the articles that Ted has recently written, because here in the COVID-19 era, it's important that we be thinking about the data that we collect, even for good uh, purposes related to public health, and to be thinking about how that data can be used uh, for other purposes as well. So uh, thanks for joining us, and hope to see you back here next time for another episode of Tending Bar. We'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.